So I'm Beth Falber, and I am a nursing faculty. Um, I have been a clinical faculty member in the School of Nursing, and for the last <coughs> year and a half-ish, I've been working in continuing studies, so now I'm teaching adult learners in non-credit classes. Um, but in the process of moving over, I began teaching for extension in the online program, as well as uh, doing a little stint last spring at Johns Hopkins. My claim to fame this year is that I have worked in four different LMS systems, which is really a challenge. <laughs> but anyway, so some of what I've learned in the process, I'll be able to <laughs> share with you. But um, my, I'm going to talk about my rubric adventures. So when John talks about this story, my story goes on for five years, okay? So I'll keep coming back to this, what I wanted, what I tried, how it worked, what I did next. And then go through it again with my next adventure and the following adventure, etc. So um, the only thing I'm lacking is pictures of myself on these adventures. <laughs> so I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of a rubric. We use rubrics for different reasons. Often in the classroom type of setting, it's to grade. And why do students like rubrics? They know yes. what to expect. They know what to expect. It informs them the, what your expectations are. Right, right. So when I give students an assignment, their next question is, where's the rubric? Mm -hmm. So that I can give them clear expectations and, you know, Usually the students I'm working with want to earn an A. What does it take to earn that A? What does it take to be outstanding, you know, to you know, really do something that's exceptional? So it, it is really kind of like a roadmap for students in terms of that learning um, application assignment. How I got into rubrics was not around grading, but I saw them as a potential tool to facilitate assessment. So I got into it uh, back in 2011 when I was thinking about how can we think about what are students, how can we measure what students are learning in a course? And I was looking at it more from this big picture of programs and even the university. How can we demonstrate learning outcomes and how they change over time between when a student starts a program or starts at the university and when they finish. What I learned along the way is D2L doesn't do it for us, okay? Um, but it took me a long time to figure that out in different experiments. And now, thankfully, that we've moved to Canvas, which has a lot more analytics capabilities. And instead of being the D2L giant database that we keep putting data into all the time without being able to get anything out, Canvas will allow us to actually get informative data out about our students' learning. We'll be able to tie learning outcomes to our rubrics so that we can actually not just grade with rubrics and provide feedback with rubrics, but we can actually look at how students might be doing across the program or potentially even a, across the university. So I know Amin was really interested in that and it was good to hear that, you know, uh, somebody else was really thinking kind of about, about the big picture uh, the way I was. So um, my adventure began thinking about assessment, but also how can I streamline my grading? How can I <laughs> provide feedback to students, you know, so much of what they learn? when they try something is through the feedback that we give them. And when I have to teach 150 students, or even a group of 25, and we've got these assignments that just keep coming, how can we provide that individualized feedback so that they can learn from it and they can grow? Um, and then the other thing that I was struggling with like when I was team teaching is that there was often a lack of consistency between the different people teaching and how they would look at and grade a project uh, and lack of consistency between myself and my TA. So when we put down the criteria in the rubric, it became much easier for us to be consistent. We never did fully achieve that, but um, it 
it really does help. And I know also my own grading is not always consistent. Uh, depends on, you know, if it's a Monday morning and I haven't had my coffee, <laughs> uh, et cetera. And, and so I found myself even struggling with being consistent from the beginning of grading a, an assignment to the end of it, you know, over a, a group of different students. So those were all reasons I wanted to get into it. So I'm sure that those of you who have graded with paper rubrics might be able to relate to this. I am so thankful we've got LMSs now with drop boxes and stuff. When we moved to the LMS and to having students submit assignments into a drop box, then I started using these, you know, um, document files, usually a Word document, and I would make corrections on those. But there are so many different pieces to this process, and often I would find myself making mistakes. So I asked, okay, what if I could be both efficient, do a good job, and accurate, uh, and, and effective? So then I, I started asking around. I heard that there's like a rubrics capability in D2L, but I've never seen it working. And I found out it was in there, but it was locked up. And nobody had started using it. So then, of course, I had to find out who can help me get access to this? So I was, um, I think it was like early 2011 or something, I started working with John Thompson at Do It AT. Um, he unlocked the rubrics for me so I could kind of begin experimenting. And he and I um, did some work together trying to unpack how rubrics work in D2L and then the next semester it rolled out to campus. And we did some presentations around that. Um, and so my first adventures with rubrics were really kind of the more traditional kinds of grading. Completing a rubric and then, um, you know, using it for a written assignment in a course. And they were fairly simple, but I found that it really, you know, didn't make my job easier. I also learned what I couldn't do, very, you know, some important things about how to do it better. Um, for instance, one of the things here demonstrates that evidence and excellence, excellent understanding, an application of communication skills, and interviewing an older adult, key terms, concepts, and class from class and beyond are used and integrated throughout the paper. This is not the kind of criteria I would write today. Do you have any idea what's wrong with this one? Students won't read all that. Students won't read all that, and it contains all these different elements. What I learned in part was in order to effectively grade and provide feedback, I had to actually break this up into several different criteria. But that was my first attempt, and it did allow me to provide that feedback related to each of these different elements. One of the things that I really appreciated was that I could easily put in feedback um, that was already um, created for the students who didn't have a clue about writing. Okay? <laughs> this, you know, you need to um, go to the UW Writing Center, look at these things, work on this. Um, so, because I found that I was continually writing this kind of information up or copying and pasting into different things um, on my rubrics, what I found is I could actually, if students scored three or below on here, I could, or this way, um, I could actually put this in a standardized <coughs> feedback. So any student who had below a three, it would automatically pop up that this feedback was in there. What I learned, though, is you know you have to individualize the feedback, but it's much easier for me to go ahead and revise this than to type or copy and paste from the start. So those were things that I really liked about the efficiencies, as well as the consistencies possible with the online rubrics. I also learned that the grades and the feedback easily transferred over into a place where I could edit it. 
But what I ended up finding is that if I didn't put in that feedback and the criteria really well in D2L, sometimes this would end up being really a lot of stuff that was in there that made no difference at all. So anyway, one of the lessons if you're working with rubrics in D2L, you really need to be careful about what you put in the feedback box and what you put in the criteria box because pretty much everything that's in there is going to carry over into your feedback. And you want students to be able to just have the key information. So, one of the other things that was nice in D2L that I learned is that I could actually change their score. So if I didn't, you know, if, if it came up with a score that was either lower or higher than I felt that they deserved, then I could revise it um, to individualize once again. So what happened with that experiment? I found they were efficient and they promoted consistency and communication both for myself and in working with my team. My TA loved the online rubrics. She said it just made grading so much more efficient for her. And she was one who really didn't talk much, but she was like glowing when she asked, you know, when I asked her about it. I also found that students really got a lot out of the feedback that I was providing, especially when it was individualized, because I was tending to put in answers to why did I mark two points off for this. I learned that that was one of the keys to success. You know, you really need to be able to, in your rubric feedback, say, you know, why did I mark you down? They don't want, you know, you don't necessarily have to put any, anything when they did well, but if you mark them down for anything, they want to know why. And this allowed me to give them that feedback and then for them, you know, to potentially revise. And actually, students wanted the opportunity to revise. They have the feedback, they know where they could do better, they wanted to actually redo their papers and earn full points. So I had to deal with that issue. That's more work, but it also raises the question of what am I going to do with those grades? Am I going to give them full points? How am I going to adjust their grade based on not doing it so well the first time? Those are philosophy questions, right? Your philosophy of teaching. But the idea that students actually then had some feedback, they wanted to revise their work, that's learning. That's where the true learning happens, I think, is when they learn from their mistakes and they are able to do it better next time. Um, so, things I learned, the criteria have to be distinct and specific. Each of those different levels has to be differentiated instead of squishing them all together. And one of the other things <coughs> I learned is you always want to put a missing option in there so that students can earn zero points for missing. But, um, you know, you also have to adjust the points well on your rubric so that the end grade is fair. Because if they did the work, then they earn, they should earn, you know, some points. So separating out criteria that were not distinct on this rubric that we, uh, we were using on paper, we had two different performance um, expectations in the same column. What do you think? You probably can't read this, but just general impression. <laughs> this is too long, right? <laughs> this needs to be separated out. So then this is a more uh, appropriate example. So within a rubric, you can put in sections and under that section, you can put in the different criteria. So we have differentiated um, points here because this section's worth a lot more than the introductory section. And then within there, we've got these different criteria. It looks more organized, doesn't it? And you can easily go through and figure out, did they do this or didn't they? And where do we need to, you know, go next in the feedback or the grading. The other thing that's really important when you're de developing your rubric 
in addition to the specific criteria is ensuring that you have differentiated all your different levels of performance. So you can put whatever you like in those rows of, you know, what you're saying about, you know, in some places it might be the benchmark. You might put excellent. Here I chose to put accomplished, developing, beginning, missing. So you can see that, you know, this is showing they have achieved. Okay, this is the highest level of expectation. This is the student who is still developing. It says some learning objectives. Here it says all learning objectives. Here it says they are vague or incomplete in the student who's beginning. Then of course the missing column. So any questions at this point? Okay. One of the other things that um, I experimented with a little later on but that I'm showing you right now the idea of a text rubric. So rather than being tied to points like we saw previously, this one does not have any points assigned. But we've got meets expectations, doesn't meet expectations, and not present. So it's a much simpler rubric. But it will allow you to give feedback. And if there's a grade attached to it, one of the things that I now really like to do, feeling more mature in <laughs> my grading capabilities than I was earlier in my life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm able to um, potentially tie some grades either, you know, say, you know, that you're, I'm marking you down two points because you did not include this. I'm giving you an extra point because it was really well done. Or this could just be performative feedback. So maybe for a draft. Okay, and then students see that, okay, I'm doing well here. These are the areas where I really need to focus and, oh, no, I forgot that. So that works very well when you have an assignment draft. They can revise and then they can go on and get graded either with the same rubric or with another one that has the same things but with more descriptors. I really don't like to change it up. You know, I like to use the same rubric throughout um, an assignment to try to be specific, but there are a lot of different ways you can do it. So one of the things I did next was I used rubrics not in the classroom, but for um, providing feedback and looking at student um, performance in clinical. So as a nursing professor, taking my students into the hospital, and um, that's very qualitative, right? But we do did have a rubric for our evaluation. So what I wanted to do was to take those rubric components, put them into this online format so that I could actually te um, start filling out the rubric when they were at clinical. So on the hospital floor, I would get into my LMS rubric for the student. And as I saw what they were doing related to different criteria, I could actually begin making notes. I found that that was really great because it allowed me to give them feedback based on what was actually happening. And nursing instructors through the years have used note cards in their pockets or other methods of kind of writing down what students have done. I was never good at the note cards in the pocket. But what I found was I was able to make notes in the rubric and then all of that was already organized so that when I went to do their final evaluation, I was able to easily pull all of this data I'd been collecting over the course of half a semester into their final evaluation. It was much more accurate, much more informative for the student, rather than me trying to remember, oh, yeah, I think they did pretty well, or to copy and paste things that I had written for other people. Uh, yeah, not good. So. <laughs> Um, so they were promising for that real-time assessment. I was unable to go into it to the depth that I wanted to. I also tried to get other instructors to do it too, and they didn't buy that. Um, <laughs> one of the other things that I learned, though, is that if I highlighted words on the rubric, 
that were related to the differentiation, it really helped both me and the student to be able to see where they were at. Excellent, good, adequate, poor, very poor. Just, you know, being able to differentiate very quickly. So that's another best practice I would recommend as you're creating your criteria across the board. What are those key words? Just bold them and then it's very clear to everybody. And one of the things that I also learned while I wanted to show growth over time, like to fill out one rubric at the beginning of the semester and fill out the same rubric, you know, a copy of it and to show, compare the two over time, I couldn't easily do that in D2L. So that's kind of where that assessment piece seems to be lacking in D2L. In Canvas, I'm hoping we can do that more easily, but I don't know at this point. That'll be a, something that we'll learn. Yes. Can you do that one more time? Sorry. About so what I wanted to be able to do ideally with these clinical performance uh, types of things, I would love to be able to assess the student in that online rubric in clinical at the beginning, do it middle, do it again at the end, and show how they moved up in that rubric over time, their development. And there wasn't any capability in D2L when I was doing it that would allow me to take that same rubric and compare two or three different time points. So that's what we're hoping Thanks. we'll be able to achieve. Um, and so I had already talked about the text rubrics, the idea of essentially getting students full points at the beginning as opposed to adding up all these different points for these different pieces of the paper or assignment. So where I'm at now, I really like this idea of giving students kind of like a 96 out of 100 as a basic grade and then you go down or up from there on the rubric and I'm able to say, okay, I'm marking you two points down here because of this, I'm giving you an extra point because you really did an exceptional job here. I really like that um, method because um, it's really assuming that all students are doing well and then it's um, kind of differentiating them based on um, how they're doing with these different elements. Yeah. So what, how did you pick such a high so it can be wherever you're at. So in this group, the students always got, you know, okay. Okay. okay, but it would really be based on, you know, what the um, maybe median grade would be for your class. Okay, that makes sense. You know, but, you know, with some of these um, assignments, students were typically getting A's. And yet, I wanted to be able to especially reward those who were doing exceptionally well. And that was uh, not really easily achieved in some of the other things that I was trying. So one of the things I learned in doing that is that it was harder for me to be more consistent, to be consistent in scoring, because I had to remember, okay, so when students do this, I'm taking off how many points? It wasn't written into my rubric. So I kind of had to make a list of my standard deductions and things I would give, give um, higher credit for. But across the board, I really liked it. And students were getting more um, focused feedback. And then what I did most recently, um, my challenge was I had to develop a concept map assignment in a brand new course, um, teaching nur nursing theory. And this is a really, so it's an assignment, a concept map assignment that I had worked on years ago and developed. And I brought it into this new environment, customized it for the school's curriculum. and. And it was kind of the way for students to tie together all of the different things that we addressed over time and to also bring in these aspects of community-based learning, chronic care management, and different things that I didn't think were so easily demonstrated and taught during the course. So I brought up this rubric. <laughs> 
This was a group assignment. And I have used it in the past with students um, who were not at such a prestigious place, but who did exceptionally well with this working in pairs. So what I decided was we'll do it as a group assignment. And, um, and yet, how the heck am I going to grade this? OK. <laughs> and how the heck am I going to explain what my expectations are with this? So what I did to explain how to fill this out, I actually demonstrated filling it out. I uh, recorded in Camtasia how I was filling this out talking about my thinking as a nurse all along the way. Um, and so students had that opportunity to view the video to learn how to do this. They also practiced it um, using it. So they did kind of a formative assignment early on. And then they had to do it as uh, a summative assignment at the end of middle or end of the course. So what I was given in creating this assignment. This was all I was given. I was not given a concept map. I was given this very basic rubric, pass, fail. This was a great assignment. So I pulled out some work that a, um, a student had done for me when she was interning under me. Um, and we were developing this rubric project together. She had developed a rubric for the concept map. So I really broke it out and made it um, a lot more appropriate based on some of the lessons I've learned. And yes, it's very complex. But as you can see, this is a very complex assignment. This, though, allowed me for every one of those boxes or every set of those boxes to say, this is what I'm looking for. This is what you are expected to be able to show. And then it also helped clarify, you know, what exactly am I grading based on? So this is way over the top, but that was my latest adventure. And actually, I got to say, it worked really well. So this was one of the groups um, map. And this is how I ended up doing most of the grading. Um, I was commuting from Baltimore back to Madison and back to Baltimore. So I didn't actually have online capabilities during most of that time. So I went back to doing it on Word documents and highlighting in the rubric. And then when I got back online, I was able to just transfer that information in. Not ideal. Or, or I could just give this to the students if I wanted to. But um, one of the big things I learned is that if you're going to use online rubrics, you've got to have online capabilities. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. But I really actually liked how this turned out because I was able to easily see and the students could easily see where they were doing, you know, things better and not so good. And then to be able to give them individualized feedback on these different things. What I gotta say is I'm really glad it was a group assignment because I would not have been able to do it with individuals doing this. So those are some of my basic adventures, things I've learned. And um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions at this point, I guess. <laughs>